Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch Program. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. And we're streaming live, I would normally say at this point, on both Facebook and YouTube. Today looks like just Facebook. We'll work on it. And those videos are available to watch anytime afterwards. And if you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. Our new temporary exhibit of rarely shown flags from the MDAH collection has opened upstairs in the FedEx Exhibition Hall. Admission to the exhibit is free, as is admission to the museums for History's Lunch attendees, so take advantage of that. We're excited to partner with the Mississippi Book Festival to welcome back Eddie Glaude Jr. tomorrow, April 4th. Beginning at 5 p.m., he'll be signing copies of his new book, We Are the Leaders We Have Been Looking For, and we'll have copies for sale here. Then at 6 p.m., he'll be in conversation with the former director of these museums, Pamela Jr. That'll happen in this space. You don't need tickets or reservations, just show up. And there are a few slots left for our free Beginner's Genealogy Workshop next door at the State Archives that will happen this Saturday, April the 6th. You can find details and you can register on the department's website. And tickets are available for the Mississippi Freedom Seder, which will take place on Thursday, April 11th, and is co-sponsored by the Goldring Woldenberg Institute of Southern Jewish Life. Inspired by the original 1969 Freedom Seder, where hundreds of people of different backgrounds gathered to explore and celebrate freedom in the context of the civil rights movement, this communal event invites participants to the Passover table for an evening of commemoration, stories, and community building. You can find details and purchase tickets, again, on the MDH website. Finally, I hope that you'll come back next week for History's Lunch when we'll be joined by Pete Smith, who will discuss his new book on women journalists working in Mississippi from the 1880s to the 1980s. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Sean Lambert to present Around the Big House, the Archaeology of Enslavement at Prospect Hill. Sean Lambert is Assistant Professor of Archaeology at Mississippi State University. He earned his BA in Anthropology from the University of Alabama and his MA and PhD in Anthropology from the University of Oklahoma. Lambert is editor of the Mississippi Archaeology Journal. It is a fascinating project that they're doing at Prospect Hill. Help me welcome Sean Lambert to the stage. About some really cool archaeology. There it goes. Awesome. I'm going to have to get used to this. I put this on. I felt like I was at Star Trek, so I'm at the, I have to get used to it. Um, as Chris said, I'm an archaeologist. I'm a southeastern archaeologist, and um, I wanted to put that it wasn't just me doing this. Uh, I have a, a, some co um, uh, principal investigators working with me. We have some cultural anthropologists, uh, Dr. James Andrew Whitaker, as well as a biological anthropologist, Dr. Angela Dautardis, um, both at Troy University, who is working with me on this Prospect Hill project. And I'll get into more uh, of that here in a little bit. But I first wanted to talk to you about kind of what kind of archaeologist I am. I think if we look at the kind of the history of archaeology, a lot of the archaeological information has been kind of um, unidirectionally back and forth to each archaeologist. So that information a lot of times throughout history has not really gotten out into the public. So the last 20 or so years, especially the last 10 or so years, um, there's been a, a kind of another type of archaeology called community-engaged archaeology. And that's kind of the archaeologist that I am. And what community-engaged archaeology does is really kind of break down those academic barriers. You know, we want that information not only just to be shared between academics, but also share that information with the public. And it's to use that power of archaeology and that generation of archaeological knowledge to actually, you know, think about archaeology and interpretation of the archaeology in a very imaginative ways. And so one way we do this as a community archaeologist is really trying to incorporate as many voices as possible. So this is um, kind of hard for archaeology because we're not really trained to do it this way because we kind of some way feel that we're kind of harbingers of that knowledge that we, if we're working on a site for multiple years or maybe that a site for our entire career, there's some field of like internal ownership of that site. But for our community-engaged archaeologists, we work together as a community. Um, and this involves a lot of different voices, people with diverse backgrounds, descendant communities, the public, and we're all working together to try to interpret the site um, and, and really create a much richer narrative of the past and also build um, collaborative relationships. And not only the collaborative relationships, but intellectual relationships with the public, 
and with the descendant community. So that's my primary goal here when I work with these uh, uh, types of sites like Prospect Hill throughout Mississippi. Um, so Prospect Hill is a kind of a early 19th uh, century plantation site um, in uh, Jefferson uh, County in the southwest Mississippi. It's just outside of Natchez, uh, one of the most beautiful places to go. Uh, I just visited Natchez when I first got here uh, becoming a professor about five years ago, and that's it's one of the most beautiful places, and I like to go and, uh, as many times as possible. And what you see here is the standing, uh, the standing plantation, the big house, the main house. And we'll talk more about that um, here in a second. Um, but what, uh, Captain Ross, um, from the early 1800s, Isaac Ross and his wife Jane, as you can see on the uh, see below, uh, came uh, came down to Natchez uh, in 1808, um, where they brought um, their family, their children, and approximately 60 enslaved uh, individuals. They moved to South Carolina and went to uh, Mississippi, and they built the first house um, that is uh, Prospect Hill, um, and they uh, purchased uh, several hundred acres at that moment. Um, and this is uh, their daughter, Jane Ross Wade, and as you can see, um, their, their children, Walter Wade is his grandson, Isaac Ross Wade, which I'll talk about more in a second because he's kind of a pivotal character in the history of Prospect Hill. Um, Isaac Ross lived for a while in Mississippi, but he, however, he died in about 1836, so about you know, 30 years um, living at Prospect Hill. And interestingly, he, uh, he left a very large estate, and something that's a little bit different from um, his will than other plantation owners at the time is that uh, he uh, decided uh, to uh, uh, not only give much of his wealth away, but he also decided uh, that he would, uh, you know, free um, most of his in, uh, the people who were enslaved at the at uh, the Prospect Hill site um, to be removed and then uh, sent to Liberia in West Africa. Uh, and this was all part of the Mississippi Colonization Society at this time, uh, which began in 1831. And the goal of the colonization societies, Mississippi had one, there were some other ones as well, um, was really to kind of free enslaved uh, individuals to American colonies in West Africa. Liberia um, was one of the pr uh, places where a lot of American colonies were being uh, created at that time. And this was what we call kind of Mississippi in Africa, um, especially in Sano County right here. If you can see, here's like Sano County. Um, and, and Greenville is where uh, m most of the Prospect Hill enslaved individuals um, went to, and they settled at that area. And we'll talk more about that, because Liberia is a huge connection, um, because this is what this is happening is this is a really interesting reverse African diaspora. So rather than enslaved people coming into the United States, it's the reverse. United, they're leaving the United States and going back to West Africa. And this is really interesting. I don't know if anybody's gone to Liberia. Um, we're planning to go next year. I'll talk about that in a second. But a lot of places in Liberia and the surrounding have Mississippi-type names. Uh, and uh, it's because of that Mississippi-African um, connection. And uh, the actual the settlement's capital was named Greenville. Not from Greenville, Mississippi, because we, we always kind of get that kind of mixed up. But it was after James Green, a major Natchez area planner who supported the cause um, during that time. Now, I do want to preface that this was kind of a progressive movement back in the 19th century, um, but it was still highly, uh, if we look back retroactively, it was still um, racially motivated. So it's important to understand that one of the reasons why they were so-called freeing individuals to West Africa is because many of them didn't think that they could stay uh, successfully in the United States at the time. So we have to understand the, you know, the negatives and positives um, of, of this movement. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the grandson, as I talked to you about three seconds ago, so the grandson Isaac Ross Wade, what happened is that um, when his grandfather passed away, he uh, did not want um, to uphold the, uh, his grandfather's will. So I really it was like a nine-year court battle that ensued that pretty much... Um, uh, created this liminal space the, um, for the enslaved people who were going to go to Liberia for nine years. They finally won the case, and then um, finally um, uh, they were able to, uh, to, to leave to West Africa. Now, on eight, April 22nd, 1845, one of the reasons why it took this long uh, is because uh, a fire destroyed Prospect Hill. So it, uh, it happened in the middle of the night. Um, uh, the fire started, people left, one, person, one individual passed away, um, and uh, killing uh, Martha Richardson and, 
And this is her uh, tombstone that's at Prospect Hill now. And there's a lot of r interesting stories kind of around that, um, around that event. Uh, uh, a lot of people were blaming the enslaved individuals at that time for causing the fire. Um, some say that it was just, you know, a, a lantern that had fallen over. So you get a lot of competing uh, stories about actually what happened there. And I, if you kind of look at some of, Walt, uh, some of his grand, the grandson's journals at that time, he was kind of using that as a kind of excuse um, uh, to kind to make sure to keep as many enslaved individuals as possible. <clears throat> but it didn't happen, so nine years happened, and then they finally, the passengers, where they were sit on the ship, um, sailed to Liberia from New Orleans. Unfortunately, by the time many of them got to New Orleans, there was a, like a major cholera outbreak at that time, so several people didn't make it. They died in New Orleans because of that outbreak. Um, but many uh, people did uh, survive and go to Liberia. And what's really amazing now, what's really what was kind of a, propelled this project is those, li those descendants of, those li uh, of the people who moved to Liberia are living today and they're understanding this really interesting kind of global connection of, with them and Mississippi. Um, so we're working with cultural anthropologists who work in Liberia, working with those descendants to kind of do archaeology here in Mississippi um, and starting to work with local descendants here on that side in Mississippi to kind of kind of understand this kind of global history that connects Mississippi and Liberia together. Now, of course, when they get to West Africa, they were promised um, a lot of resources, a lot of money could to kind of start their new settlements at that time. Now, unfortunately, if you uh, they wrote back to the Amer to the Mississippi American uh, Colonization Society. And unfortunately, what they were saying is that, you know, they weren't really promised. What they were promised was not given to them. And, and they were really upset, um, and they didn't really know what to do. Uh, and so it was very hard for them. So they sent letters, and those have been kind of published um, in this book by um, Wiley. And it just talks about the struggles that they were going, uh, going through at that time, um, about kind of being in a land that, you know, they don't know, and the, um, and the struggles of being, trying to start a new lives in Liberia. So it did take them a long time um, to get settled at, um, in West Africa. Now, the new house, um, after the first house burned, the new house was built in 1854, and here's some of the photos from the 1940s. And even in the 1940s, you can kind of tell that it wasn't quite good looking, um, and that there's still some uh, several structural issues, and that's still plaguing that house today. Um, and so here's some really um, interesting, um, really interesting photos. Uh, and here is, this one right here is kind of an interesting drawing um, of, one of, the, uh, of one of the descendants of, of where the house was and what the internal uh, rooms were of the house. And right here is known as uh, either the kitchen house or the laundry house. And this is the area that we excavated last year. And this is the site, that, this is the area um, where we're going to be excavating uh, in this summer. And there's not been a ton of research. Um, Alan Huffman is here. I'm so glad that he's here. But uh, there's not been tons of, of archaeological research. There's really been one master's thesis by a student um, at Ole Miss um, who did some shovel testing of the site, um, some limited shovel testing just to kind of understand the range of, of archaeological materials at that site. Um, but other than that, there's been no larger scale excavation, and there's really been no uh, focus on the spaces of enslavement where the people who were enslaved were living and working. Um, Alan Huffman wrote a wonderful book called Mississippi in Africa that kind of details a lot of the history um, and the oral memories of some of uh, the descendants of this site. So you definitely need to go and check out that book. It's really great. Now, in 2011, um, the Archaeological Conservancy decided to actually purchase Prospect Hill. So they purchased the house as well as a few acres. And then by 2012, um, they purchased an additional 20 acres. So, so our, the Archaeological Conservancy owns about 23 acres of Prospect Hill. Now, that's just a way less than 1% because uh, it, I think, was almost 4,000 acres um, that, that plant, the plantation was just at 4,000 or just over 4,000 acres. So there's a lot of uh, area that we don't, um, that, are, that are owned by private owners. So maybe that's something that we can work for uh, towards in the future is like working with the landowners um, to maybe do some archeology span and some work out there as well. 
<clears throat> so we worked out there last year from June 18th to 26th. It was really, really hot. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to like Na- southwest Mississippi or Natchez area, but it's just like a soup bowl. Uh, and um, you get there for five minutes, and I'm just absolutely com- covered in sweat. Um, and it's pretty much that happens in Prospect Hill. And we went there June 18th, 26th. What was special about this one, it was completely open to the public. Um, I think by the time uh, the last day, we had 120 visitors, almost, uh, almost 200 people who came in. But we had almost 120 participants working on uh, the actual ex- helping us excavate the site. And we had over 200 people who were just visiting the site, wanting to know more um, about the history of that site. And one of the main primary uh, methods that we wanted to do working at Prospect Hill is to, to make sure that we work with the descendant communities work with the public. Uh, We wanted to excavate the spaces uh, of enslavement where these people were living and working because that's something that is lacking to understand that history, especially in Mississippi and arguably throughout the Southeast. Um, And we also did, I'll talk about in a second, some non-destructive archaeological methods called ground penetrating radar to locate the original foundation of the first house that burned down. And from from, uh, that excavation, um, we, I, th- I think, almost 4,000 artifacts were found in, in almost pretty much just eight days of excavation. So there's still a lot more um, um, to do. Um, but what we're showing, there's a lot of information that's out there. And so we really wanted to develop research strategies with descendant communities in Mississippi and Liberia. So that's what this next excavation I'll talk about here in a second is trying to strengthen those relationships with um, descendant communities here in Mississippi and descendant communities in Liberia and working with them um, to kind of understand the history um, and those cultural heritage connections um, to this site. And this right here is a picture of, of the, uh, the, bottom, the bottom middle um, of, of the Prospect Hill before, um, before the uh, Archaeological Conservancy raised, I think it was like a hundred and something thousand dollars to put a new roof on the house. Um, this is an interesting LIDAR image. So as you can see, um, that uh, it's a really like uh, human-built um, area. So it was definitely built up. Um, and this is where the house is right here. And we excavated right here where the kitchen house is right there. And so if you go this way, this is where the gardens are um, to the right. Uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting landform. This is, you can still see the original road that went in front um, of Prospect Hill. And so the first thing that we did when we, when we started excavation is, of course, we wanted to lay out our grid uh, and start laying with these little one-by-one-meter grid squares that we're going to excavate slowly, methodically, you know, every 10 or so uh, centimeters. Uh, I think I did five centimeters because I, it's uh, pretty shallow materials. Uh, and so by the time that we finished the, ex- the, the first excavation at Prospect Hill, we opened 17 one-by-one-meter units. Um, and we uncovered uh, two uh, structures. Um, And as you can see here, we uncovered the original foundation um, of the kitchen house. Uh, And this is really interesting uh, structure. And as you can see, um, these are concrete brick piers that are from a later building. Um, We think that the kitchen house may have burned down and then at the turn of this 20th century, another structure was built on top of it. Um, so we found the original foundation um, underneath those. And as you can see, there's a lot of little bitty one by one meter square units that we need to do to uncover um, this, uh, this entire area. And we still have no idea what this is. Um, so that's another goal for uh, this summer is to figure out what the use of this building was. It could be either a smokehouse, it could be an outhouse of some of a sorts. Um, it is kind of nice because it kind of slopes down, um, and so an outhouse because it's kind of a way the it, the the wind moves into the woods. So if you're if it's, if you're going to use a restroom, you know it's it's a good and it's far enough away from the house and that makes sense. Um, so if anybody want to excavate that this year, that would be great. Uh, you guys laugh, but it's like the the coolest place. It's like the that's like where all the cool stuff is. And don't ask me why, but that's just where all the cool stuff usually uh, happens. Um, <laughs> but the main point of this excavation um, was, yes, to discover the, art, discover the artifacts, discover the objects that tells us the story of the past and how that resonates um, today, but it's also really wanting to work with the public and educating the public, working with the public, and learning from the public at the same time, learning with one another, and just doing some really fun science outside and not trying to pass out. 
And here's another one. Here's, uh, this is a, a busier day for us. And so I think this is that mid, mid excavation. As you can see, we had already opened several, several units. The cool thing is we're, uh, we're under shade most of the day, which is really nice. Um, um, but it's still like 100,000 100, degrees. Um, and yeah, and so the, the other structure that, that you guys are going to excavate is down, down here a little bit. Um, and so we had a lot, like I said, a lot of visitors. We had hundreds of visitors coming in, some who just wanted to look at the house, someone who just wanted to look at the cemetery of the family who are buried there, um, and some who really wanted to get, you know, and dirty. And uh, we have one, Miss Martha, over there who uh, worked with us for several days, her and her daughter, and she did an, they did an amazing job. Um, arguably better than some of my um, undergrad students. Um, <laughs> I won't tell them that, though. But. Uh, and so what we want to do, we, we found the, the actual original foundation, which is we wanted to see that intact. We didn't know if it was completely destroyed or if it was um, a newer building. So when we found those older bricks, we knew we were hitting an early 19th century to mid-19th century structure. And these are, the, these are the newer bricks. So you can kind of tell the difference between the older bricks right here. They're a lot more fragile. Um, um, they're easy to break. And these are much higher fired brick, probably for the turn of the 20th century. So this, these uh, uh, foundation piers and this foundations are completely two separate buildings. Now what's really cool is that we found a lot of amazing artifacts, which... Uh, um, that really helps, starts to tell the story of what was going on and, and kind of um, brings life into the, the life of the enslaved history um, in Mississippi and at the site. Um, one of the cool artifacts that we found, we were finding internal features um, of how the house was built. Here's on the front door lock plate that was still um, together right beside each other. Uh, and so that was a really wonderful find. We, one of the most ubiquitous or the most commonly found artifacts that we find are ceramics. And I don't know how many people love ceramics, but I am, I am a huge ceramic fan. So I love, I love pre-European contact ceramics, all the way up ceramics to, to pre-Civil War. So ceramics tell us, tells us a lot about the people who are using them um, for different purposes, uh, from domestic um, to special events. It also tells you which ones are really inexpensive, but also which ones that were really expensive. So it kind of tells you the social economic um, dynamics and the social inequalities that were happening at that time. And so, as you can see, we were finding a lot of these really beautiful blue um, uh, transfer printed stuff that's really, really expensive, but uh, most of the stuff that we're finding in the kitchen house um, were inexpensive, inexpensive items. So here at the top right here, uh, the, top uh, the top photo is what you would more find in, uh, in, uh, in an area of enslavement uh, where people were living. Uh, and this is kind of your blue shell edged whiteware. Here's another type of scalloped version of that blue shell whiteware. Here's your polychromed, uh, hand painted, uh, probably a bowl or a teacup. And one of my favorites um, are mocha ware. Um, these were incredibly cheap to get, and everyone had, many people had access to those types of objects. Now, the, more of the expensive stuff we also found in the kitchen house, which kind of makes sense because the kitchen house at that time were used to, to serve um, uh, the people in the main house. So we did find some really, really expensive stuff like blue transfer printed, um, mulberry transfer print, which is kind of this really pretty kind of purpley red green transfer print, and then we found a, a good bit of actually like porcelain, and porcelain was very expensive at that time, that, 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 uh, um, that really high-fired kale and clay. And so this tells, starts telling the story of, their, um, of how, what people were using and why they were using it. Um, we found in an, almost an entire set of um, cutlery, um, kitchen um, uh, items like these, and we knew that they were not being used uh, um, for the people in the, the main house, but most likely they were actually probably, uh, they were made out of wrought iron, um, and they were um, cold hammered almost um, into these forms. So we found uh, spoons, forks, and knives, and so we, we pretty much were hypothesizing at the moment that this was most likely made by the enslaved individuals that were living and working at the kitchen house. So we found an entire kind of like kitchen set of these. I mean, 
we know now we wouldn't want to cut use like wrought iron stuff because they they like they tend to um, erode and, and rust pretty quickly. Um, but the preservation here is pretty amazing. So this is in a beautiful shape without doing any washing or what whatever. It was just in a pristine uh, condition. All these were found right next to one another. Uh, all the pieces, which saying is that when the things that were had fallen through cracks or when the house burned, that everything is still nightly and uh, and staying where they uh, should be. So that gives us a lot of information about the preservation of this site. This is me really, really excited finding our first piece of 19th century stoneware. Um, I'm called like the prancing deer. Um, so when people find a marble or a, a, I get really excited if I find a nail, um, I like will prance over like a deer and like would love to, and like, like tell people what we found. And they found the first um, alkaline glazed um, uh, stoneware, uh, and it was just really cool because it was like early 19th century. And so we were telling them, and this is one of my my student helpers who were like, "All right, we had enough of you, Sean." So, <laughs> but I didn't care clearly. <laughs> And this, as you can see here, looking at my forearm, that's not dirt. The, the first day I was there, I touched a branch, and I just got poison ivy. I'm so, I don't know if you guys are, are I, I get poison ivy. I could look at poison ivy and get it, so I had to, I was like, just dip myself in calamine lotion the entire week. Um, another thing that we found that is really interesting is, is tobacco um, pipes. Um, this is the, the, the bowl portion of, of the ceramic pipes. We're also finding stems. Now we're working, which is really interesting, we're actually working with Angela Detardis, who's the biological anthropologist. She studies ancient and modern DNA, and we're going to be this year use, um, sending these off as samples, but also finding, hopefully finding more, and sending those off as well as other types of objects like glass bottle ba bases, and sending them off for DNA analysis, because there's new techniques now that can actually get my mitochondrial DNA from artifacts. So um, to actually being able to tell like the actual person who actually used um, these materials. Um, here we found a lot of glass. If you love bottle glass, um, we're finding tons and tons of um, liquor bottles, uh, champagne bottles, wine bottles. Um, uh, yeah, so it was just amazing set of, of different types of glasswares. Uh, I love nails. I can't say that enough. Nails tell you so much. I know it seems like I'm a very much of a nerd in that respect, but nails tell us a whole bunch about in terms of the history of, this, of the structure and the different structures that may or may not have been there. So a lot of the nails that we're finding here in un, uh, the A are these uh, square or cut nails. Uh, these are indicative of a, an early 1800s to mid 1800s structure. So these nails are period to the kitchen house where um, the enslaved individuals lived and worked. Now the ones to the right are what we call wire nails uh, or round nails. And these are much later turn of the 20th century, and those were being found in context with the newer structure that clearly was built. So it, was, it wasn't too far into the excavation that I started to realize that we have two buildings um, on top of, that are on top of each other here. So, you know, all that in five nails, pretty cool. We, have, we found more than five nails, but yeah. Um, another thing that we were finding uh, in terms of uh, uh, enslaved life is, is finding the, the clothes or the buttons that they were wearing um, that tell us a lot about um, their life as well. So we we're finding more kind of expensive uh, pearl, like uh, shell buttons, uh, carved shell buttons, um, porcelain buttons, uh, which is uh, C, and then the last one is kind of your like really, really cheap um, uh, ferrous metal or iron uh, buttons. Uh, and that's really cool. And what's really, I don't have to show the picture here, but we, uh, just because I, maybe because of the sensitive nature of them uh, in some ways, but we found several buttons that has, that mother of pearl buttons that actually had been carved um, with iconography or imagery um, that was very particularly um, important to um, African belief systems. And so I didn't want to put those there um, just until we work with the, to, until we work with um, the, uh, the Senate communities more um, so they can decide what, you know, what should be shown and what shouldn't be shown. Okay. But again, um, a lot of people would just, you know, just say there were buttons and put them in a bag. But we, working with descendant communities, we're, we're looking at artifacts in a whole 
different way, um, in a lot of different way than I was trained as an archaeologist. And without that collaboration, um, it would tell a much uh, different story. I would say one of the most interesting things that I think that's probably at a lot of these, um, these period sites is, um, you, like you said, you find a lot of glass. This is just a lot of glass in my hand. So if you look kind of far away, you're like, oh, those are just wine bottles, medicine bottles. This is a medicine bottle right here. Um, this is to, uh, yeah, this is medicine, bo uh, medicine bottle, medicine bottle, um, wine bottle, wine bottle. And if you look at it from far away, it just looks like pieces of glass. But I started to realize when I was looking, I was like, these look weird. They've actually been shaped. Um, they've been, there's some intentionality behind that. Someone has taken the pieces that when they break and actually fashioning them into, um, uh, into actual tools. And so what we're seeing is they're actually fashioning um, broken bottles, these European-made bottles, and they're fashioning them um, into um, knives and scrapers, um, which is really, really interesting. Um, and we've just from the seven or eight days that were out there last semester, we found almost 30 of them, 30. And so we're expecting to find a lot more of these types of tools, kind of expediently made uh, tools. And looking in the literature, there's not a ton of information on it. Actually, the most of the information that I'm finding is actually in archaeology and historical records in West Africa, where this was a common practice um, since the early colonial times, where they were kind of switching from stone and, and, and switching from stone to, to glass. Uh, and this was, these were really important objects for them to sharpen wood or to polish wood implements, um, as well as to cut hickory for uh, hickory basket weaving. Um, so it could be something that's uh, really important for these uh, tools that were really important to, uh, to do traditional practices. We don't know that 100% yet, but it's something that we're working towards. So again, just a small little artifact that could just be put in a bag as just broken glass from a bottle can tell a huge, huge story. Another um, really interesting um, set of objects, I don't know from all here because the, the potential of it, of the sensitive nature of them, um, I just, I'm just showing this one. Can anyone tell me what this is? Can any, when I first found these, I had absolutely no idea what they were. Can anyone, can anyone guess? If I've told you already, you guys can't say it. I've told a few, a few people. Huh? Well, the, you kind of got the first part right. Like it's a leg, part of a leg. So when I, it's, it's only this big. Right? So it's like they're like this big. And we found them, and I had no idea. I was like, is this bone? And I was like, it looks like bone. I was like, Cause, but it also kind of looks like a tooth. I was like, it can't be tooth. And so I, I sent pictures of it uh, to, uh, to my uh, zoo arc, uh, an archaeologist who studies bone. He's like, I don't know what that is. So I actually just kind of put them to the side. Um, because as you could, didn't know what they were, we were excavating another area of the kitchen house, and we found this actually attached to the actual leg bone um, of the animal. And it's a chicken spur, a chicken spur. And I, I, it, made me re, it made me like, oh, reevaluate these. So I was looking at them again, and I was looking at what a regular chicken spur was, because, I, I mean, I've done a lot of archaeology. I've never found a chicken spur in my life. Um, and so I was looking at chicken spurs, and they look a lot different than this. And so I was studying them more. These have been polished. They've been ground down polished, and as you can see, uh, and then also cut, intentionally cut from the femur of the chicken, and uh, an incised groove on both of them um, have been incised around it. I had no idea what this would mean, so I scoured other um, um, uh, plantation reports, um, and I actually did find two other in, uh, uh, um, examples at plantation sites in the southeast where they found chicken spurs that had been altered in a very similar way. And then, then I went to, to stuff in West Africa and working with the Liberian descendant communities over there, and they were saying that um, these were kind of like um, protection, that they would wear these around the neck and like as some sort of amulets of some kind. Um, we don't know that 100%, but it's really interesting that this could be. This was actually in, within an actual uh, feature as well. So not only did we find the chicken spurs, um, we found um, a, a hawk's talon, a wildcat's tooth, um, a hog's tooth, and there were some other teeth that I had no idea what they are. We're, we're working to, get to, um, to figure those out. All discreetly... Um, and it seemed like they were wrapped in something at some point because they're all really tightly together. And this, we found this 
um, someone had buried this at the entrance of the enslaved dwelling. And so this was, and also the other examples, they were also buried at the entrance to a building, into something. So we have no idea what that actually means or working with uh, our descendant communities to kind of understand the, the significance and the meaning behind that. And so we're finding some really, really interesting things. And, and I think without working with descendant communities, archaeologists would say, oh, that's a chicken spur bone. Let's put it in a bag. Let's label it. Let's put it in the curation bag and put it in a curation box and let it be there for a thousand years. Um, but it's making me, I never thought I would look at chicken spur uh, <laughs> in this way, um, but it, it's telling a huge story of, of perhaps something of you know resiliency and um, and 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 um, keeping uh, important traditions uh, alive um, that are from perhaps something from um, their uh, West African heritage. Um, another thing that we're finding too is uh, an immense amount of bricks with fingerprints, and this is something that uh, um, where we know that um, at Prospect Hill there was a kiln on site. Um, and we know that they usually um, uh, made younger enslaved people to m uh, m uh, mix the clay and mold the bricks um, for, the s for, the, for, the, uh, for the house and other uh, con uh, construction. And we can actually see a lot of these really small little fingerprints um, in the brick um, that we're finding and that we're hopefully at one point ex will exhibit them with those, um, with those histories. So those are really special too. Um, another thing that we did beyond excavation is also make sure that we do non-destructive archaeology in areas that we don't know what really is going on, but we want to kind of narrow that focus a little bit. And so what we did is do uh, ground penetrating radar, which sends these just radar waves into the ground, bounces it back up, and so that we can see what's under the ground without actually having um, to uh, actually having to dig. And so I wanted to do ground penetrating radar where that blue box is um, behind the second house that was built because I wanted to see if the uh, house foundation is still underneath the ground from the, from the first house. And as you can see, it is. So this is the actual the foundations of um, the original house. And I just missed the other one, which um, the, the, the story of this, this, the first house being much larger than the second house is true because this would be a much larger footprint. So this year we'll put in some excavation units over here um, to kind of expose that foundation because these are, this space right there in the back is also where people who were enslaved most likely lived. Um, so we definitely want to work in that area as well. Um, we also we almost made, we almost, uh, also made uh, best friends. Um, this is Nerbert. Um, he lived on me the entire eight days. He, when I go to the site, he would jump on me. He would be on my shoulder like a parrot all day, um, visiting fe uh, people, greeting them. I have no idea why. I wanted to take him home, but I didn't. Um, but he was, it was just interesting that he stood on me for eight days. I have no idea. Uh, I let him, so I didn't, I didn't really care. However, sometimes I was surprised because one time he clanged on my face from the tree, and so that was kind of surprising. And I don't know why every time, <laughs> every time I'm at any archaeological site, I will turn over something, and there is a scary baby doll. Every time. And here's one, <laughs> and which is not the scariest, by the way, that I found. Um, but... <laughs> Unfortunately, when we were when we found him, he's this this th this thing, um, evil thing, um, is older than fifty years. So, <laughs> because it's older than fifty years, I have to I have to like take it with the with the site. So we actually had to to wash it, curate it, and now it's in a bag that is <laughs> that is attached to the history of Prospect Hill. Um, so sometimes uh, it's an interesting thing. So we get some more modern stuff with some of the older things. So. Um, always scary baby doll parts, no matter where I go. They're following me everywhere. Um, but we also made sure that um, we continued to work. A lot of people don't know what in the world happens to the objects that uh, after you get done excavating. And actually a lot of the work, much of the work of archaeologists is what we do after the excavation. Actually, in some instances, 99% of our jobs is, is actually washing, analyzing, digitizing, um, the collection, and also making sure they're in curation-grade bags and boxes to preserve them for future generations and for research. Um, and that's what we did. So pretty much right after uh, that excavation, we wor I worked with some students who uh, did all that washing, curating, digitizing the entire collection. 
Um, so now we have, I have no backlog, and so now we're ready for this year um, to get uh, another set of artifacts to bring into our lab to also process them. So it's just an important part of that. Um, I will say that we got a lot of media coverage for this, uh, for this excavation. Uh, we continue to get a lot of interesting, uh, a really great feedback, a lot of interest um, globally from Liberia to Mississippi who are interested in this type of work that we're doing. And so it's kind of exploded in the last uh, uh, couple of years. Now that we especially are, my team has grown to multiple anthropologists doing oral history interviews um, uh, like Andrew Whitaker is, and doing uh, DNA analysis like Angela DeTardis is from Troy University. And so it's really growing into this very multidisciplinary, uh, holistic approach of kind of using all of the power of archaeology and anthropology and working with descendant communities to tell the, probably the richest narrative we possibly can uh, for Prospect Hill. Um, this year, we're going to be out there in the, unfortunately the hottest dang time um, as possible, and I am so sorry because I want all of you guys to be there. Um, from July 15th to July uh, to August 11th, um, we're, we're going to be working with archaeologists, descendant communities, cultural anthropologists, biological anthropologists. It's open to the public every day for an entire month, so you can be there for an entire month um, if you would like. Uh, and we're going to be doing, uh, like I said, we're going to be sampling objects um, for DNA analysis. We're going to be doing oral interviews with descendant communities, doing non-destructive stuff, and um, um, excavations. So uh, bring you and your family out for a day or two. It would be really, it would be a lot of fun. Uh, our next thing is we've we've submitted a, a grant uh, for uh, the National Geographic, of uh, a National Geographic grant to fund our. Uh, work in Liberia. So now that we're doing work here at, uh, at Prospect Hill, we are now going to be excavating those first settlements, working with the Liberian descendants and the Liberian government to do excavations at those first settlements when they, uh, when they arrive there um, in Greenville, in Sano County, Liberia. Um, and so we're going to be doing oral history interviews, we're going to do DNA analysis as well over there to understand how people moved across that landscape and it's this kind of really global framework and the history of enslavement on a global scale from Mississippi um, to Africa. Um, and so many thanks um, to the Archaeological Conservancy who owns it and who allows us to do research there. The National Geographic, I'm just hoping I'm going to put their name in because it's like I hope if they fund us in the next few months. Um, Mississippi State University, Troy, uh, Mississippi Hannes Council, and of course Mississippi Department of Archives and History and the two museums that um, uh, invited us here today to do this wonderful uh, presentation. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. I think we have time for questions. If anybody has a question, you can raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I had two questions and one suggestion. Um, on the uh, descendant communities, did some, some not go to Africa? I thought, I thought they'd all gone to Africa. Go ahead. No, they did not all. All of them did not um, go. If you, look, if you read... Uh, if you read uh, Ross's will, some stayed and some uh, didn't go. And that gave, he gave them the choice okay. um, to go to Liberia if they wanted to or not. Okay. So not all of them, uh, not all of them uh, went to Liberia. Okay, the, sec the que second question is, why would, the descendant com com why would descendant communities not want something shown? You gave an example of a mother of pearl card button. Um, because of the, 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 the history of that um, and um, the meaning behind that, uh, the religious Be nature, the possible. The yes, because the, the imagery that was on the button um, ha could be high religious significance. And so it was something that we decided not to show until we work with the uh, descendant communities to make sure that's something we want to show. Um, the, the motif or the, the image that are on some of these buttons. Um, um, was in, is a kind of indicative of, of an African cos of their cosmological universe. So you can kind of think as a little microcosm in one little button. Um, and so we might look at it as just a button, but in some descendant communities' eyes, that could be their entire worldview. So we want to make sure that um, um, we want to show that. Uh, we get permission to show that before we do. Okay, and, and my suggestion, and my wife disclaims any responsibility for it, <laughs> but the chicken spur could have been used in cockfighting. Uh, it looked like it was meant to be attached to something. Yeah, um, and so we did find some leather twine um, that was um, next to that. So we do know that it was most likely tied, um, some sort of uh, a leather twine. Um, and from the context from the other um, chicken spurs um, and the, the, that they were found, 
Um, it could be, um, and we're working with descendant communities to kind of figure what the actual function of those items could be. But yeah, I mean, it could be, it could be something completely different. Thank you. Hi, I, I have a um, two-part two question. For, for those um, people who went um, to Liberia, um, what what kind? How how was the area that they settled in uh, chosen? Because I'm I'm sort of comparing it here to um, where where they put the um, Jewish people in Israel, they just designated a spot and plopped them down there and other people are already there. And I, I've also heard discussions that um, some of the, the, the people who returned then treated the, the native like they had been treated over here. So I will say that the, those are great questions. Um, I will say that the environment on which they settled in Sano County, Liberia, could probably could not get much more different <laughs> than the environment here in Mississippi. Um, they went. Uh, it was definitely a, like a rainforest area. They were uh, many of them were settled on this very large river on the on kind of the edge of the rainforest. At the um, so they definitely had. They definitely. With going into an environment and not actually knowing how to like to to work in that environment, and they and you can see that uh, struggle in the, many of the letters they're sending back to the Mississippi Colonization Society, saying that they don't know how to work in this land. And as a for yeah, and you are right. So they were put in a situation where there were already local communities there, um, and there are stories that um, of. Uh, forced labor of those local communities, or um, there's also li uh, there's a lot of different uh, stories about how they interacted with those local communities in Liberia, and those stories are still something that is, is a kind of a hot topic um, uh, to the descendant communities in Liberia. Um, some say that they were um, they worked well with the local communities, and some families say that they didn't work well with the local communities, and and one of the reasons. Um, that you can see in some of the letters that they were writing back is that, you know, they weren't, uh, the people who left to go to Liberia, they weren't really seen um, as people who could be integrated into the United States, and they definitely didn't feel like they could be integrated in Liberia, so they kind of was in this kind of, like, no state. You know, they, it was very difficult for them to acclimate to those new local conditions. So, yeah, so we, I'm really interested to work with the descendant communities to shed light on... Though, and how they, um, how they worked with the local communities and how they kind of were, you know, survived um, in a completely new area across the world. So that's good. As sometimes happens, a virtual party has broken out in the chat for our video with everyone saying where they're watching from. We've got Georgia, Maryland, Colorado, uh, Kansas, Kansas City, oh, wow. California, and uh, Carolyn Wade Alice, probably mispronouncing her last name, says she's watching from Aptos, California, and is a descendant of Isaac Ross. And then Sarah Campbell asks, do you have a genealogical research component to this project? It's, 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 we're working with the, we're working with, uh, we can kind of start doing that working with the, the descendant communities. Uh, also the, uh, the DNA work um, will also maybe help build that lineage and understand the, the migration and the movement of people. Um, during that time, but it's very difficult sometimes. Uh, while some plantation owner, pl plantation owners like Concord Quarters, they were they they put the last names of the ins all the enslaved individuals. So it's very it's sometimes easier to kind of create a lineage. But Isaac Ross, it doesn't seem like he did that in in, in, in most of his in his will or in his journal. So sometimes it's, it's a little bit more difficult. So we're we're really relying on working with descendant communities and their historical connections and memory. Of their of their of their familial collect, uh, connections to the site and to the ancestors, and that's something that's going to take a very long time to do. You just can't do that in a couple years to build something like that. Thank you for that um, <clears throat> brilliant 
presentation. Thank you. Quite informative. Um, I think in the first place, um, before I get to my question, um, I think your story makes a, a, a good uh, would su support the, um, the contention of those people who, su who support the um, reparation movement. I think that the, 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 the cultural connections and there's the economic connections of past and present society, slave society and present day society, there is a definite connection. And so the reparation people has a good case that they could use some of your help. Um, but my, my question is, um, you plan to plan to go to um, Liberia, which of course is in Africa, and um, you plan, I don't know how long you plan to spend there, but I was wondering about um, what kind of, um, 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 the people in Nigeria, of course, the locals there, the people that you are gonna have to work with, and, um, but the language, what the, the language problems, the problems of the, the culture of the, of the local community, problems where, um, they, they, whether you're working with students or the, 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 the native people, or, or, or the, the, um, the, the um, climate and the weather and all those different types of things that you're gonna have to deal with. Oh yes. Uh, uh, depending on how long you're gonna be there for. Are, are, are you have this kind of knowledge and how you're gonna be able to deal with the, the conditions there and how suitable the conditions are gonna be to um, deal with your um, study? That's so fantastic, and I will say, if you asked me two years ago, like, will you ever see yourself doing archaeology in Liberia, I would probably say no. Um, uh, and uh, so one of the wonderful things about um, adding to our, uh, to kind of uh, our um, research team and our uh, descendant, uh, research team that includes descendant communities in Liberia is that, uh, so we have a lot of informants, we have a lot of uh, local community uh, members who are helping us with that. Um, so we also have um, researchers like uh, uh, Andrew Whitaker, who is a cultural anthropologist, who his main research is in Liberia, who, which is in Sano County. Um, and so we are working mainly through him to help us get to that point where we can create an itinerary to go there. We definitely know that we're most likely going, of course, either before or after the rainy season. Um, and it's going to be very difficult. Uh, we've got to, uh, we've got to go to Monrovia. Um, and then we got to fly a charter flight to, um, uh, to Greenville, and then from Greenville, we have to literally go on motorcycles um, to get, to, uh, to, get to, the, uh, the, to those settlements, and we have to do that every single day. Uh, we plan on being there about two to three weeks to do the archaeology, the oral, the oral interviews, and, the, uh, and working with and some biological sampling as well. And so we're working with the Liberian government, we're working with um, local um, communities in Monrovia, and we're working with local communities in uh, Greenville um, to help us with that. So yeah, it's definitely a lot of inf it's a lot of it's a lot of collaboration to make this a success as possible. Could we presume on you to say a few words about your experience with the field school? <laughs> Thanks, Martha. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Martha Hudson, a retired educator from Clinton. Uh, which is not too far from the site. And for me, this experience was like a, 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 a circle um, that came around for me. I remember growing up and really being interested in archeology. span Well, that was not such a field for women at that time. And women in Mississippi, there was no school of archeology span at Mississippi State. So I did the next best thing, and I became a history educator. <laughs> and I taught Mississippi history, read Alan Huffman's wonderful book, and Alan and I lived down the road from each other practically. Uh, taught my students about Prospect Hill and the Liberia settlement and all. And so when I became aware that um, there was an archeological dig, uh, being held at Prospect Hill, and that members of the public uh, with no experience uh, and who thought they could withstand the heat were invited. Uh, well, here I go, and my husband rolled his eyes, but he does that a lot. 
so anyway, uh, my daughter and I went out. Uh, I was able to go back about four or five days. And uh, um, it was just the neatest experience. Um, and I appreciated learning so much from Sean, uh, giving me an experience that kind of brought me full circle, but also an experience that brings uh, this history together from one end to another and seeing what happened at Prospect Hill, looking at Liberia and bringing that all together. And to me, that's history and archeology span at its very best. So I thank you for the experience. I would encourage those of you, um, take your portable fans and head, head out there. We're gonna make sure to have more portable fans and running water this, this year, so. <laughs> And porta potties, by the way. Yeah, oh, did you not have porta potties last year? No. Oh dear. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Uh, well, and I'm, after that, this is going to seem like sort of a boring question, but I may have missed it on the map. I'm an archaeologist, obviously. Um, I saw where the big house was and where the kitchen house that you did excavate, and you referenced the areas where the enslaved people were actually living, but I didn't see where that was relative to the big house. So we know that there were. Uh, let me see if I can go back. Get back past the, the, the baby doll thing. Uh, okay, I have clearly too many slides. So this is where the house is, and this is where uh, the kitchen house was. I mean, we know that several um, from the from the diaries and the journals that several enslaved people were living and working in the kitchen house. So our first efforts was trying to get understand this uh, to locate it and uh, to do archaeology there. Now the uh, where the other enslaved cabins are yeah. are are somewhere across 4,000 acres of land that we don't have access to because it's owned by someone else. So after we get done with this, um, uh, this type of work, kind of more local to the next to the house, we would love to work with the landowners to maybe to locate and do some work at those areas. And from the Archaeological Conservancy, we have um, some idea where they could be. Now, of course, I'm trying to think, look at the, the big map here, um, the early 1800s map. Um, it doesn't really tell you. I think there is some place where it does say like uh, slave cabins um, on this map, and uh, we can going to use kind of this map and some other hand drawn maps that we have to help us locate where those um, um, areas are. Okay. Yeah. I, but there, there was information they were actually living in the the kitchen house. Yeah, as well. that's okay. a very com. It was um, uh, it was a very common uh, for people to live and work in the kitchen houses, um, and especially in the in the plantation. Uh, plantation science in Southwest Mississippi. Okay. It was a quite sizable. It was a quite sizable um, um, structure. One more question, real quick. Yeah. If you don't get money from National Geographic, who's funding your month in this summer? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I'm not saying we're putting all of our eggs in one basket, um, but we do have. Uh, we'll we'll go to NSF. Um, uh, we'll go to NEH. Um, if we don't get um, uh, National Geographic. National Geographic is great um, because they kind of just give you the money and because um, we won't be able to get a lot of receipts when we're in Liberia for the things that we have to do in terms of purchasing items. And so it's just a lot easier through that. Um, and National Geographic has already shown kind of interest because we've already met with the program officer. Um, and so we're hoping um, with their work, with their, with their, and this is an area that they haven't done a lot of work, um, so we're hoping that that makes it a little bit more interesting to them. So, thank you. Have you found any uh, artifacts that link to other com uh, surrounding communities? No. <laughs> Not yet. We, I will say, no, I'm so sorry. What we, there is a, a Native American component to that site. Uh, very small. I think we have found one projectile point, um, and it was a late archaic projectile point. Um, and uh, it was on the outskirts, and we left it where it should be. But other than that, no. Any other questions? One last question. So I've had the privilege of going to the site a number of years ago, and I see it's heavily 
there's quite a bit of vegetation around it as it stands right now. Do you have a sense of how much further out you might go to excavate eventually if you could? Uh, I will say, yeah, a lot of that used to be open land, so a lot, and all of it's now just wooded areas. And so we definitely would have, so it, it would be really difficult, almost impossible to do like ground penetrating radar. So we definitely would have to narrow our focus and work with landowners to be able to do uh, archaeology. But yes, we, we definitely plan on um, going past that, into that vegetation at some point. I will say past that vegetation, once on you get on uh, many different uh, landowner uh, plots, is that they're, very, they're cleared out. Um, and we can see some evidence of older structures that could be there, that could be the slave cabin. So if, we, if those are it, then uh, um, it would be much easier to get access those. So yeah. Sean, for folks who are interested in getting involved in next or this summer's dig, what should they do? Should they get a hold of you? Yeah, they, they? Uh, just email me um, also, but you're free to just come. Um, you don't, I don't, I'm not gonna be creating a list of, uh, of people who are going to come every day. I just want you to come out. Uh, it'll be, all, like I said, um, uh, mid, uh, mid-July mid to, to mid-August. I will be out there. So we just, we're just going to be starting, get there from 9 to nine to 3, so, and just have fun. Yeah. And, but, you, but you can find me on Mississippi State University's website. It's really easy, and I can give you my email, too. Yeah. So no publication from Sean on this yet. We do have two soon-to-be-signed copies of Alan Huffman's book that'll be in the store if any of you haven't read that. Alan, you did a history's lunch on this 20 years ago. It was great. Um, don't forget, Eddie Glaude here tomorrow evening. All sorts of stuff um, that the department has going on. And then come back for history's lunch next week when Pete Smith will talk about the history of women journalists in the state from the 1880s to the 1980s. For now, help me thank Sean Lambert for this fantastic you, program today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.